what if a genesis and laminar structure is all the, like Colette de Hay and mm -hmm. people like that, they, they have that fairly well worked out in the mammal, no? In mammals, it's, it's well worked out for uh, cack monkeys and, and mice and, and rats. Okay. Uh, and presumably, it mainly varies in, in how long cortical genesis takes place right. and the timing of different components, right. yeah. uh, but not in the order. But Pashko Rakesh did a lot of this stuff on the macaque monkey brain, brain and he's a strong proponent of no known neurons in cortex. No? No, no. But now he has to admit that some come you know, from a lateral source. But, but, and he said he didn't talk about the olfactory problem where you're getting the neurons all the time. But his story, if I can tell that, for, take away from my other time, is, is that you get married, you go on a honeymoon, you come back three weeks later, all refreshed. Most of your body has been regenerated in that time. New skin cells, new intestine cells, all over your body, new cells. But not a single one in your brain, all the same. <laughs> And maybe that's good, so you recognize your wife and you get up in the morning. <laughs> I'm gonna skip some things here. This is just to, to, to point out that I've emphasized cortex, but other parts of the brain have changed as well. And if you take two visual animals that aren't closely related, not, they're, they're related, but not that closely, Tree shoes I'll talk about, squirrels I won't, hedgehogs I already talked about. Uh, you can see that here's the dorsal lateral geniculate in the thalamus. There's, it's not very distinct from the rest of the thalamus at all. Here it is in a squirrel, very distinct and laminated. Here it is in a tree shoe, very distinct and laminated. Let's look at the midbrain. Midbrain here, here it is in a hedgehog. This is what early mammals would be like, by the way, this degree of difference. You, you, you don't see any real structure in here at all. Look at this nice structure in a highly visual squirrel, highly visual tree shrew, beautiful structure. So things have evolved independently uh, in a similar way on these two lines. Here's a summary, and I'm just gonna skip that because there isn't much time. Uh, and, but here are the, the, rates, the placental mammals, the four major groups of placental mammals, and what we want to be interested in here now is eucontoglears. And eucontoglears have glears, which would be lagomorphs and rodents. Lagomorphs are rabbits and pikas. Uh, in, in, you, over here in this line, it divides up into uh, uh, flying lemurs, which aren't lemurs and don't fly, and tree shoes and primates. So these are, would be our comparisons that you want to make to get the ancestor of this group. You'd want to compare across here, and you want to compare across here if you want to get the ancestor of primates. But there aren't many to look at. We could look at a lot of rodents, of course, but that would be redundant. We want to look at tree shoes because flying lemurs uh, glide, and, but they're really not available for study. I've looked at some of the brains, but that's about it. So here's a tree shoe, which Legros Clark once classified as a primate because of similarities to primates, but again, the same mistake because he looked at the visual system and the visual system probably by uh, convergent evolution has many resemblances that would fool you into thinking this must be a primate. But they don't look very much like a primate, so we have other reasons. But genetically now we know they're distant enough that you wouldn't put them in there. And the brain isn't very much like a primate brain uh, either in the sense that uh, we, we pride ourselves on our frontal lobes. And frontal lobes are for planning, thinking ahead, uh, weighing the consequences of your behavior. And this would be an animal that doesn't weigh the consequences of its behavior very often. The main thing it does is run away. It's got to get be fast. But it is visual and a visual predator. And this is uh, one of my students' summary of uh, uh, brain organization built on other studies, but he really studied the motor cortex and so on. And uh, <coughs> what's there is uh, some visual areas take up this huge amount of temporal cortex, so it is highly visual. Auditory down here, there are usual somatosensory areas here. This is showing different 
uh, body parts, forelimb here, face is always large for almost all mammals, large face representation because they use their face in motor activity and use their face as a sensory region. More than forepaw is unusual. That comes in with primates. But one of the points here is, is that uh, the connections uh, to motor cortex come from visual areas and this is a very little region that we can call posterior parietal cortex which becomes huge in primates and I'll, I'll want to get to that. But here's an anatomical experiment with an injection in the hand representation in, in uh, somatosensory cortex and there are two somatosensory areas, mirror image is the one out of here and here's a joined hand region and the connections match. Uh, good. And, but uh, no, nothing direct from motor cortex instead to this proprioceptive area here and to this other somatosensory belt region here. Very few connections uh, back here. Uh, and here's in contrast the projection uh, injection into motor cortex and now we see that we get lots of visual inputs directly to motor cortex. Not directly somatosensory. Uh, Indirectly, we get somatosensory, but a lot of visual inputs from these visual areas and also from this little bit of posterior parietal cortex. But posterior parietal cortex is not the main source of visual information. It's not the hippopotamus What? Motor cortex. Oh, sorry. Motor cortex. So, where is the motor cortex getting its information from? Uh, it's getting its information from visual areas directly. There's one similarity in the visual system that suggests that tree shoes did bring something. Their ancestors of tree shoes and primates did have something in common. Well, this is still a question that could be parallel evolution. And those of you that know uh, visual cortex organization know that uh, cells there represent the orientation of a stimulus. And the cells that are activated by the same orientation in primates are grouped together in primary visual cortex. And this is a color code for that grouping done by optical imaging here. Uh, and also connections were studied and cells that have the same uh, preference will be selectively interconnected. This is from a David Fitzpatrick's study. But the point is, is that tree shoes have this kind of cortical organization in primary visual cortex. All primates do and rodents do not. Even squirrels with a highly developed visual system do not have this. So it wouldn't go back into an ancestor of the whole group. Uh, Eucontigra's ancestors wouldn't have this feature. It's not a feature common to mammals. It's an unusual feature for mammals. But all primates and tree shoes share it. So we could say it's likely that this developed before that breakup occurred between those two lines of evolution. So there's the evidence that uh, rodents may have that orientation. Uh, they have orientation selective cells, but they're not grouped. Oh, in the barrel cortex, yes. Yeah. So it could yeah. be a property of the way the cortical surface itself organizes itself. That's at least true for rats, and I don't know if it's been demonstrated in mice, but I would guess it'd be there. But uh, squirrels are highly visual and are using their vibrissae to identify objects like rats and mice are. So I, I'm not sure what, if the rat system would even hold for all rodents. Uh, th but well, the squirrel is a highly visual rodent. Right? Okay. Okay. So you don't get any more visual than that in rodents. Yeah. What? What kind of organization do you find in a squirrel case, for instance? Because as in the style of cortical projections, you already involve some constraints in how this can yeah. organize right. itself. So it will not be random. No. So it, it might not look like this. So what structure do you find? The, the property of orientation selectivity is thought to be created by the cortical wiring, the selectivity. Although some people argue there's a bias from the geniculus cells that's already starting with the, the retinal cells. So uh, they could be grouped or not grouped depending on the kind of intrinsic wiring that you would, you would get. So there will be a group this is, will look different. Yeah. Okay. So the, these, you would get the homogeneous color because the individual cells are randomly distributed and they're not selectively interconnected. 
regions aren't, cells might be selectively interconnected, but regions are not selectively interconnected. So I won't go into a summary here either because we're running out and I wanted to just go through a couple other things very fast, not even this, but early primates were nocturnal, small, they had to adjust to a uh, fine branch living, so they had to have coordination, they had to have eye-hand coordination. Uh, the snout is reduced, large eyes. Uh, they're not going to grasp food with their face so often because that endangers their eyes. It's safer to grab it with, the, with your hand. Uh, and uh, of the mammals or primates that exist today, we have some representatives that look a lot like the early primates. Their brain shape is highly similar, although somewhat bigger for the body size. This would be the African prosimians. Galagos would be the most least specialized out of the prosimian group. And uh, so not your typical looking primate, but they are nocturnal. And we've studied them a lot. And I'm going to just go quickly, but we can see there are a lot of cortical areas. And we can start to identify these areas in the visual system that are specific and only have been identified in primates. Like MT over here, this collection of areas around MT have which deal with uh, motion analysis have, have all uh, been identified only in primates, although they might, it's possible that other animals might have them. Posterior parietal cortex is huge. You can see this huge area, PP, over here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and very quickly. And you have modular components, cytochrome oxidase blobs. All primates have them. None of the non-primates. Uh, in, in, the, in the whole uh, uh, eucontaglers have, have th this feature of suborganization or banding in V2, this weak banding here. So there's a lot of things that I could talk about. But I want to talk about some subdivisions that are functionally related uh, of posterior parietal cortex and the adjoining somatosensory cortex that have to do with grassing behavior, defensive behavior, and reaching behavior. And the reason that we know that it has that behavior has to do with electrical stimulation and other studies. But I just want to point out that areas can, these two areas can be defined architectonically in fat cortex. This other region around here also can be defined. You probably can't see it because it's faint and so on. So we have, uh, here in these cases, we have microelectrode mapping data, anatomical connection data, uh, architectonic data to support these kind of conclusions. Uh, and uh, are there three visual areas, V1, V2, V3? This has been controversial until about just a few years ago when the brain I showed you figured out that they're, they're how to answer that question. And the question to convince people was answered uh, anatomically. An injection was made here. It seems very simple. The question is, is whether there's a third area out here. People thought there was an area up here, but not down here. So, if you inject here, you get labeled here, and you get labeled here. There's three areas, right? We also get labeled here, it's fainter, and we get labeled over here, it's fainter. But you can't see unless you uh, go to higher power. Uh, so we know what the main connections are very easily. But I want to talk in just five minutes about uh, uh, Michael uh, Graziano, who uh, introduced me to a different way of looking at the organization of cortex through electrical stimulation. We'd use electrical stimulation for many years, but short cranes of electrical stimulation, which invoke a little tiny movement like a finger movement. So you can map motor cortex that way and get a somatotopic or a homunculus kind of map of motor movements there and in premotor cortex and so on. We use that quite a bit. But what he did was look at the traditional motor areas, but in a different way, and I won't go into their somatotopy, looking at longer trains. And this was used in Spain a long time ago. And I don't know if you know the, these experiments, but they're really old. And, and uh, uh, Diego was quite brave here, because he's standing here with a, not a sword, but a, a radio transmitter. And there's an electrode buried in the bull's brain. And when the bull is charging him, he turns it on and stimulates its brain, and the bull changes his mind about what it wants to do, or at least it stops and doesn't kill him. <laughs> he tried it out on graduate students until they perfected it. 
And when uh, Graziano used long half-second trains of electrical pulses in, in awake macaque monkeys and motor cortex, he got uh, more complex movements. So you got defensive movements here and hand-to-mouth movements here, a manipulation, hand manipulation movements over here. And that intrigued me after I saw this. I said, well, can we use this to investigate other parts of the brain? He also uh, looked at a region in posterior parietal cortex and found he could get defensive movements there from a region that had been defined before. And this is what a defensive movement to an air puff looks like. So the monkey gets the air puff, it's noxious, and it shuts its eye and grimaces and puts its hand up to protect its face. So, uh, and these are my two co-workers who worked on this with me and I have no time. So we looked at posterior parietal cortex and anesthetized galagos and we could do this and get the movements in it. So the animal isn't thinking I want to make a movement or doing anything, it's anesthetized, but it still does it. We got face defensive here, forelimb defensive here, hind limb and forelimb together as if climbing, forelimb reach, hand to mouth movements here, forelimb face, face aggressive movements here, and uh, re grasping movements up here which came in a later experiment so it's not on this uh, slide. And this is just some of the movements, I won't go into it. But here they are, we've found these three main movements and other movements but we've concentrated on looking in New World Monkey grasping here, defensive reach, uh, because they're pretty reliable. So it's not just in prosimian primates. And here's a squirrel monkey, same three regions we've identified. So do two different New World monkeys. And in macaque monkeys, we haven't done that much, but we got a face defensive region here, a grasp region here. Uh, Graziano found a defensive region here, and other people have implicated this region and reach as well back here. So you have this reach, defense, grass, in the same sort of spatial relationship in all these primates, and we don't get anything like this in a uh, rodent or in a tree shoe and so on. We don't even see much posterior parietal cortex. So posterior parietal cortex has become an important part of the brain. It's an important part in all primates. This is a part that's especially enlarged in the human brain, would be used for all kinds of tool manipulations, all kinds of different tasks that are specific to humans. But we have regions for ethologically, I would say, relevant behaviors pre-wired uh, into the system. And of course, this system works through motor cortex. So if we put a block, a muscomole block in motor cortex, you can't get the behavior anymore. We know where to go. Yes? Well, if they were learned, you, I'm not saying the experience would, would modify them, but they're always in the same spatial relationships, and they're in spatial relationships across primate species that have been separated by uh, uh, millions of years. Uh, so, if, and I'll go back to uh, when we were talking about uh, the lobsters, you're going to have to have some behaviors that you can't really learn because by the time you learn them, it's too late, you're dead. And a defensive posture, an aggressive posture, would be things that you would think you can modify in by experience, but they have to be sort of pre-wired. And so, so we would think these same behaviors would be in other animals, but having centers for controlling them in posterior parietal cortex wouldn't be in non-primates. This is a new addition added to the machinery. I do find this very surprising. It's really interesting. Yeah. I'm reminded of Wilder Penfield uh, because he was doing these stimulation studies in humans. <laughs> do, your, do your methods, do these methods you're talking about differ significantly from what uh, Penfield did? They use surface stimulation, which is which is harder because it's hard to get enough current to get the pyramidal cells that are providing output uh, and shorter times. Uh, but Sherrington using surface uh, simulation and, uh, in the early, you know, 100 years ago or more uh, studies. Uh, 
when they did their ma maps, they said, this is the map of the first movement. If we continue to simulate, we get a continuation and a more complex movement. But people were not interested in the more complex movement. They were interested in the first movement because for a neurologist, that would give them some localization information. Here, there's supposed to be a coordination because you took the same yeah. movement. It's, it's a movement that, ta that uh, takes about as, uh, the time course of these movements is about a half a second. And we have information on the time course and so on. Uh, we, all, we have information on connections. We also have optical imaging when we're electrically stimulating. We can see what other parts of cortex are activated. Because a criticism is, is if you look at the connections and say, well, you're connecting to other parts of posterior parietal cortex, everything must be going on. You, you don't have an idea of what you're doing. But if you use optical imaging, uh, it appears that the connections to other posterior parietal cortex aren't, they, it goes no further. It dies there because we think it's selectively on the inhibitory neurons and it's to make a decision of, of what behavior out of the arrays of behavior that you can have should be made. So they're mutually ex inhibitory. And if you start one, you kill off the others. What leads you to start one and not another, we would guess would be not only sensory inputs, but prefrontal inputs as well. So John, are you saying that this is the complete set of these, these stereotype behaviors that would be? These are the behaviors we've looked at. And, and I should say, if you look, uh, you go from face aggressive to face plus four on aggressive behaviors. But as you move the electrode around here, you get that category, but it changes with location. Mm -hmm. it, the, the exact form of it changes. The reach movement might change. Uh, in the, where the reach is directed, for example. So uh, within there, there's suborganization. And we've only done one experiment where we tried to train the animal with reaching hundreds and hundreds of times a day. And we, we, we thought that we could enhance the, this kind of behavior by that training. Whether that really is true or not, I can't say from one animal. But they also have much more primitive sensors that are very much engaged in controlling the stereotype behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, areas. yes. So is this, is this part of the motor system really interacting with, with areas like the central brain? So yeah, the older areas are there and I have a, a nice uh, postdoc now from Estonia mm -hmm. who uh, is not afraid of hard things. <laughs> 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 and he's going to be looking at the subcortical connections because these would have to link in right. with those appropriate centers, yeah. amygdala and other places as well. But he's just going to look at the defensive circuitry in more detail. But you're exactly right because th this would be an add-on in a sense. The posterior prior cortex would be an add-on to a system that was already there and largely the specifics of it would be mediated in subcortically, I think. Mm -hmm. but you could imagine Depending on what the behavior. So that the, uh, the, the function of the organization of these behaviors migrates from the midbrain to the cortex in the same way that uh, some of the visual functions of the visual midbrain yeah. So you can have functions that uh, were completely subcortical and, and then no longer can be mediated solely subcortically. Yeah. If you were widely speculating, would you think that in human higher cognitive function that there might be some, I don't know, like say in the same way that reaching is something we better know how to do mm -hmm. more or less before we're born, maybe certain kinds of thinking yeah, you're, you're, or language. Anybody that, there's two things that babies do. They reach and then they put things in their mouth. Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty basic at an early stage. But uh, in, posterior, in functional imaging studies, uh, posterior parietal cortex regions uh, are, seem to be heavily involved in, in uh, tool use or even thinking about tool use. And so we have you know, so many abilities that depend on extending our body by using tools that. Mm -hmm. Uh, chimpanzees do to a limited extent, but most mammals do not use tools in the same way we do. So this would be a pre-adaptation just by good fortune for moving into tool use. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just a comment about uh, rodents. So in, in the motor cortex, uh, in the bristle region, uh, there is a small area 
could be. It could be. And uh, I, there's a report of getting defensive movements by stimulating the tectum in, in rodents. So there are other places that, that we need to consider. I'm not even going to summarize things here because I'm out of time. I, all I can say is, is that this is a, a souped up version of the macaque monkey thing that I showed you before. Didn't have time to put all the label on here. I can find a hundred things wrong with this. <laughs> but, this the, but if you take this at its face value, uh, there, there are proposed 90 areas. Uh, 98 areas in, 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 in the macaque monkey brain. It's speculated that human brain would have over 200 areas that you could, were functionally distinct. Is that it's very, alone? No, the, the whole thing. The whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah, not just vision. Vision stays at, and, and now I'm going to, can I just have five minutes? Uh, Anybody <laughs> against that? So I just want to talk about. Another way we can learn about brain evolution, and I don't have time to really go into it, but smallest primate, largest primate brain, that's the relative difference, not the absolute. And so a lot of people have thought about scaling as a way of, of scaling rules, developing scaling rules and thinking, mm -hmm. you know, what do you have to do when you go from a large to a small brain? And I, you know, this is to just demonstrate that in our imagination we're fascinated by this uh, Dali picture because we know that the elephants could never walk on something like this. We know it's impossible, so that we're, we're intrigued by things that are unusual or seem to be impossible. And this is just that neurons, as they scale up, uh, gain bulk in their axons and in their dendrites disproportionately and creates a problem of space in the brain, especially for long connections as they get longer. And this is just that if lar cortical areas get larger, it's by ch making changes in the dendritic arbor, it's harder to change what they do. Small areas can change what they do by the uh, smaller changes in, in the circuitry of individual neurons. So smaller areas in principle would be more valuable. Large areas in principle can only look at details of sensory or other kind of inputs. And they wouldn't be very good at global processing. So some of the largest neurons are in prefrontal cortex, and the smallest neurons, whether they're dendrites or intrinsic neurons, are in visual cortex, primary visual cortex. It's good for detail, but you wouldn't live very well with it. This is just from Elson's showing the dendritic arbors in different areas and, and how they look like from the surface view looking down. And you say it's smallest here for sure. And it's a progression because the functions change with the size of, of the area and what they're good at. And, it, and primary visual cortex in a human brain and in a macaque brain, if you flatten them out and measure the surface area, are the same size. Even though our brain is three times bigger, we haven't increased because it'd be pointless to do this. But this uh, allows us to worry about a, a wiring problem and the wiring problem can be uh, changed in a large brain by uh, making more areas and making modules within areas and having processing locally, uh, inner hemispheres specialized, few connections between the hemispheres and so on. I can't go into this, but I just want to say one thing about Susanna Herculando Huso, who introduced us to a practical way of determining how many neurons are in any structure of the, the brain. And, and that seems counterintuitive as the count of nuclei, not the cells. Because the problem with counting cells is, is that you have to identify them histologically in sections and the brain is not homogeneous. But you can basically put brain parts in a blender and, and centrifuge out the nuclei and count the nuclei. And you can do this in a flow cytometer. Where that's how we're doing it. We, you can automate the process. So you can find out, for example, this is one thing with Susanna that for the same, roughly the same size of a rodent brain and a primate brain, almost the same size, the 1.5 billion neurons, 9.9 .9 billion neurons. The neurons from Leah? What? The, the neurons from Leah? From? Leah. Glio, sorry. Glio. Oh, you can distinguish the neurons from the glia by using two different stains for different proteins in the nuclei. So 
nu n will give you neurons. Yeah. So, yeah, you, and, and I'm not talking about the other cells, but the, that's an interesting story at all. Well, the point here is, is that primates, all primates have more neurons than any other, any other animal for brains of the same size. And that means that the neurons on average has to be smaller. And if we were going to have the number of neurons in the human brain in a rodent, it would have to be uh, an unbelievably huge rodent, and it still wouldn't get to that number. So here we have a, roughly 100 billion neurons, someone less than this. This hugest rodent that ever lived would only have 24.8 billion neurons based on our scaling for neurons in rodent brains, looking at a whole range of neurons of um, rodents and a whole range of primates. This difference is huge. And here just summarizes that elephant. A chimpanzee has 6.5 billion neurons. An elephant only has 10 billion neurons, but look at it. It's got this huge brain. Look, we have uh, so many more, 8 to 20 billion roughly. Uh, I won't go into that. I'll just end. Uh, I, it'd be fun to talk more about that, but I would point out that this is uh, an inferred behavior from footprints that were left in, in, in ash, that uh, two individuals walking were sexually dimorphic, one bigger than the other. So the assumption was is that one walking there uh, three million years ago was comforting the other one, and the same thing happens today. So we retain some of these behaviors. But some people would call this mate carding. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. things that I think is so amazing about primate brains is that there's enough evidence that you can say that the number of areas from early mammals, which would be on the order of 15 to 25 in that ballpark of areas, now is clearly on the order in a, a macaque monkey of, of 90 to 100, and probably in a human over 200. Uh, so there's been an increase. We don't know that's true for any other order of mammals. We don't know that there has or has not been an increase. How uh, many in a rodent? So in a rodent, you're going to have an order of 25, 30, maybe. But nobody has looked at a large rodent. So the rat is the only one that's well understood. And so it would be great to look at a large. But it would be interesting to look at a lion brain to see if current, uh, any carnivore has quite a few auditory areas. It has a number of visual areas uh, of the ones that have been studied, cats the most. But we don't know if there's any difference in a large carnivore like a lion and a domestic cat, which has been studied extensively, or ferrets now, which have been studied quite a bit. So this, these are big gaps in our understanding. But it's pretty clear that in primates, we've taken advantage of what becoming more modular as the brain gets bigger, it has more parts, and, the, and so processing can remain fairly local for most of the things that are done. And then only a few connections would be fast and long, because as you get a bigger brain, the, the real problem is uh, connections have to be longer, that's time. The only way you can compensate for that time is to make the axons very thick, and that's space. And you, you, you know, somebody said if we wanted to do this for, with and just scale up a small primate brain to a human brain. Maintain, increasing the number of neurons and keeping the connections the same proportionally, our brains would be about the size of a bathtub, just from the, <laughs> just from the space of the connections that would be needed. So, yeah. But it's quite interesting in this, um, in this sort of evolutionary study, the, the emergence of these structure function relations. Yeah. So you show that an animal that need that uses vision has big visual areas. Animals that have other modalities that they're using 
we see uh, specialization. And, and I'm wondering about the same mm, process being applied to increased lamin laminarization. So, what, so when we see this, this um, creation of new areas, it's kind of easy to make the structure function relation. But what about the, what, what function do we gain by having increased uh, laminar structure? I think what you gain is, is that you get another dimension of specialization. Mm -hmm. So you have a crude specialization in all mammals in the neocortex, not all areas in the neocortex, but of six layers. And you can say layer six provides feedback to the structures that are providing the input. Layer four gets the, the detailed input. Layer one and other layers get other kinds of input that are more modulatory. Layer three projects the other area of cortex. Layer five projects subcortically. So on the basis of inputs, outputs, you've got that big category. But then you can start to subdivide, and you can keep things separate and specialized. So you, the, layer four can be in as many as three or four sublayers. Uh, so in one animal, you might uh, separate cells that respond to light onset from cells that respond to light offset. That's unusual, but it's done. Uh, others you will separate what's called the, the magnocellular stream from the parvocellular stream. And so within a, within a local different group. layers. Okay. So there'll be one over the other separated. Okay. And then their connections can be uh, mixed or separated sub at okay. subsequent levels. So, it's kind of a so you're starting to get more subdivisions. Yeah. And it's similar if you look at a bird of prey like a hawk or an eagle, the lamination of this optic tectum is fantastic. Mm. If you look the, yeah, if you look at the primary visual cortex of a tarsier, and I have slides, it has more subdivisions of primary visual cortex, which is a third of all cortex. It occupies a third of all cortex, just, and it's subdivided all this way. Mm. And they're visual predator specialists. They don't do much else but detect prey and grab it. Uh, how does the brain integrate uh, different sensory modalities? That's a good question. And I think in all the animals that we've talked about, there's an integration. And the in integration can, in instead of coming sooner in a human brain, I think comes later. Uh, so in a, in a mouse or rat brain, primary visual cortex will go to motor cortex. Somatosensory won't go to motor cortex. Maybe auditory does as well, I don't know. But you would have your motor functions influenced by this direct primary sensory inputs coming to these regions. Uh, in a larger brain, you will analyze the visual information and the auditory information further before you use it to influence the motor and, 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 and do multi-sensory processing. So kind of but there are some areas that are seen to be specialized in, in primate brains for multi-sensory processing and get multi-sensory areas inputs right away. And one area is a second level auditory area called uh, CM. And it gets somatosensory inputs and auditory inputs. Sens auditory inputs are at a second level of cortical processing. Somatosensory may be at a third or fourth level. But it's not clear yet why you want to make somatosensory and auditory at such an early stage. But in an opossum, uh, the pr primal ventral area, which is the second level of somatosensory processing, also processes auditory information. It, you know, so there's something <coughs> about auditory and somatosensory that mixing will be done in a different way in different species, but it's done very early if you only have a few areas. But even in primates, it can be done fairly early. And related to that, how does the brain then, uh, how does the primal <coughs> sensory area recruit? an area that's been specialized with something else, this area that's not how, stimulated. How, how, does, how do the connections patterns change in evolution? Yeah, say it's up on black line, and oh. so, uh, okay. you know. Uh, <coughs> yeah, there's been quite a bit of research in that, and, and my former student, Leah Krivitzer, has done some of it, and just publishing recently of, of having animals raised blind, or raised deaf, and what you, uh, first, uh, uh, 
what I haven't mentioned at all is many connections in the cortex especially are what people have called exuberant in development. They're, so the brain in general uh, has what uh, for a long time is one regressive events. So you have too many neurons, you have too many connections, and you lose them in development. And the, cr and the crash can be uh, tremendous, up to 80% in some structures of neurons lost, but more likely you're losing connections in neurons. So if you change the, the rules of the game and remove an auditory input or a visual input, you remove uh, uh, a competition. And so you will have visual areas becoming auditory and or auditory areas becoming visual. And uh, the interesting question, which is hard to answer, is, uh, is, is if an auditory area is responding to visual inputs, is it, is it seeing or hearing? <laughs> I mean, what's the phenomenon like in that case? But we know in humans, the braille readers, that they depend on primary visual cortex for the braille reading. And there's an unfortunate case of a, of a a braille reader who was very proficient and taught it had a stroke of primary visual cortex and she couldn't read braille anymore and she couldn't relearn it. And she, obviously, she couldn't teach it anymore. Thank you. Uh, Paul, there. <laughs> so, um, so we, we see this laminar structure of cortex emerging, right? Mm. And now, on the one hand, there, there are any suggestions that, that across this, this lamina, you might have, let's say, what, what some people call a canonical kind of micro-arrangement, micro-circuit, mm -hmm. that, that would be sort of repeated as a template throughout the whole sheet. Mm -hmm. Do you buy that? I buy that, but I would say that the details of that circuit are modified according to the functional column within an area and the, the area. So there are, in de the details are, are modified. But uh, is it modified to, let's say, 50% or 80% or 10%? Well, it, you can modify in a lot of different ways. You can modify, you know, if you're just talking about inputs and outputs, it, structurally you don't need to modify the column at all. You just, but you're modifying the functions tremendously by inputs and outputs. But some areas probably have more modulatory transmitters that would allow them to be more plastic, and some layers more plastic than others, more subject to change. Uh, some would have smaller neurons because those functions would be more important than larger neurons. The dendritic arbors would be different. The, the pattern of the intrinsic connections of how regions uh, interact uh, with one another. Uh, so it's sort of sub-layers, sub with specialized uh, cells, uh, neurotransmitters and so on, sub-layers. All these things okay. are, are and then, and then also variables. Orthogonal to the lamina, yeah. you might also see different kinds of clustering. I should also show yeah. for V1, for example, yeah. you could think about the barrel cortex, yeah. so you could think about, let's say, um, um, blobs, yeah. uh, pro and so on. Is that also a design feature? Is it a sort of different kind of clustering of, of cells? So that kind of clustering, uh, and it can be a sharp boundary or gradual. So if you think of something that's continuous, like a tone frequency uh, in auditory cortex, you, you wouldn't expect to see boundaries, but you would expect to see an arrangement. But uh, this seems to be a, a basic feature of nervous systems that they group and segregate uh, inputs. And the, ev the good evidence is really old, but I like it the best is from Martha Constantine Patton where she put in a developing uh, frog larva, put extra eyes, so they make a little slit and put an eye in. She could get uh, optic tectum, get input from two eyes instead of one. And they both want to go to the whole tectum and occupy the whole tectum but they're incompatible with one another. So they have a chemical signal, so they go to roughly the same pattern. But locally, they form stripes. They segregate completely, so you don't get two eyes. You get one eye stripe, next eye stripe, over and over again. So you either, depending on the dynamics that it's been modeled, you get either stripes or you get a dot and surround, depending on the magnitude of the two inputs for any of these kind of things. Uh, the dot and surround would be the ocular dot to the, the cytochrome oxidase blob kind of organization, for example. Right. The stripes would be what you have in, in V2. And 
those are things that are, are ocular dominance and are using right. stripes. So that's my way of looking at it. Yours too? Yeah, no, no, it makes sense. But yeah. we need sort of a competitive system yeah. Yeah. in which you organize the response for each of these nerves. And you've done some models over that. So what I liked about her data is, is that the frogs never had binocular input. You know, mm -hmm. Their ancestors never had. Yeah. And yet the nervous system didn't treated it just like you were in striped cortex or someplace where you would have two inputs right. in competition with one another. Okay, right. hey, Harold. Um, I have a question about different kinds of functional differentiation. There's the kind of functional differentiation that you've been talking about, for instance, something from sensation or motor control or olfactory sensitivity. And those divisions seem to be sort of long term I'm not sure how it's done, but I can tell you what some views are. <coughs> and one view, which would be from Wolf Singer, would be a person that would promote this, is, is that you need a different code for those kind of things. Of, of, so you have basically a, a rate code for uh, where is something, how intense it is, these simple sort of things. The neurons fire more to the stimulus or less. <coughs> that rate code is fairly stable. Uh, so they're basically arguing that the correlation of activity of neurons in one location in the brain and another location in the brain is another way of getting information. So, and that's uh, saying these things belong together or these things are part of uh, a domain. Uh, but it's a different kind of code. So the two codes are operating simultaneously. The, the correlation code is fluctuating rapidly in, in microseconds, and, and so some brain states are changing rapidly as a result. Uh, whether that's the answer or not, uh, you, we do need an answer to that kind of question. And in fact, we have interpreted many different sorts of change because we're seeing not just different patterns in the visual field, mm -hmm. but different kinds of things like there's an animal or there's a tree or there's a rock mm -hmm. or there's different kinds of mm -hmm. And people working on, 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 on non-vertebrates, I think, have made some of the best progress. I'm not really that familiar with that literature in terms of, of how circuits have a dynamic nature and what they do can change very rapidly. And that hasn't been investigated that effectively in mammals. Maybe we should give our speakers some time. <coughs> one last question. would happen, uh, and there are examples. For, for example, uh, there is uh, so-called blind mole rats, and they're not blind, but their eyes are covered with fur because they live in tunnels and they don't want to get dirt in your eyes. So they're only dimly, uh, they're photosensitive, but, but they don't form object vision anymore. But Vision is still important because you have to know the annual cycle. When to breed is very critical. 
circadian rhythms are very critical. Uh, but their striate cortex is still there. It's a tiny sliver of cortex. It's not basically non-functional and responds to auditory in inputs. But architectonically, it can be identified. It has connections with a little tiny la lateral geniculate visual nucleus. It gets visual inputs. But it doesn't, visual cortex is basically gone. 